Welcome to the Daily Planet Theater here at the Nature Research Center at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We are very excited to have our global town hall with Edward O. Wilson. And we're so glad that you could join us. And there's more of you on the second floor and even more on the third floor. Mm -hmm. And he is going to be giving a presentation and then taking questions from the audience and possibly questions from Twitter um, that might come from anywhere in the world. So to host our event this afternoon, I'd like to introduce to you the director of this new wing, the Nature Research Center, Dr. Meg Lauman. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, AKA science comedian. And please join me, our esteemed guest, and we'll take our seats. Come on up, Professor Wilson, yay! Okay, good. <laughs> Wanna get right here and careful. All right. Um, so I think you're in that chair. We do a little dance first okay. to make sure we have the right seats. <laughs> So welcome, we are so excited to have all you teenagers here. Yeah. And uh, we know that we also have teens from around the state and around the world. We have teens from North Carolina, from Ethiopia, from Ohio, from Florida. I know you're down there. Uh, we have teens that got to stay up late in both India and Australia, which is totally awesome. Keep awake, you guys. Um, and we're really excited to have this live plus virtual presentation, which is kind of what the Nature Research Center is all about. Um, so raise your hand if you love insects. Oh my gosh. Raise your hand if you don't love insects. Ooh, those are the ones to work on. <laughs> you are in for a treat. Today you will be talking with probably the world's most famous scientist of natural history. He loves ants, he loves insects, and some of you will get to ask him questions about his life, his career, and all of those amazing little tiny things that run the world, mostly with six legs. Uh, Professor Edward O. Wilson has traipsed around the globe. He might even tell you about encountering fire ants or bushmaster snakes or stinging trees, and he is an extraordinary writer as well as biologist. I am really humbled to be on this stage. Some 20 years ago, he was a mentor for me, and now that I'm an ancient biologist, that makes him a senior emeritus extraordinary mentor and friend to me and to hundreds of other scientists around the world. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the E.O. Wilson Foundation, who is here, especially their executive director, Paula Ehrlich, who masterminded this event, along with a few of us at the museum. We would love to thank Daryl Stover, the North Carolina Humanities Council Program Officer, and also Annalena Phillips, who's been an extraordinary humanities scholar that helps with programs about human beings and scientists, and we're really grateful for their support. And also our whole museum staff, I think everybody has had a role in creating this big global virtual experience. So now I'd love to turn it over to Professor Wilson, AKA Ed, AKA Bugman, uh, to just tell you some stories and we'll probably lapse into some questions and answers somewhat through this wonderful hour of science. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, and let me begin by uh, explaining why we're dressed this way. Uh, this is our jungle suit, you know, that we both have. This is field clothes that we brought here. I, if Meg uh, Loman and I were to go out into the field, and we could, we could go out right now with you and find all sorts of things alive out there, including insects, even though it's pretty cold. Well, this is what we'd wear, and if you'd like to uh, know why, um, what this thing is, I'll explain it to you right now. This is called a pooter. See, I know I can disengage this. There we go. So out we go. Now, um, let's suppose that we're out together in the forest somewhere, and uh, we're looking through the litter, and there's a rare insect, say a little beetle, Maybe it's glistening gold. Some insects actually have metallescent colors like gold, green, blue. And let's say it's a very rare specimen and it's about to disappear 
down a crack in the, uh, uh, in the leaves and things, and we've got to have that specimen. Well, we have this, and this is called a pooter, all right? And it's <laughs> serious. It's not just for beginning Boy Scouts. This is what all the entomologists use when they're out collecting because you, know, you can go right down to that insect and hook it up a little bit and I should explain what? That there's a little screen here. Right, the secret weapon. You're not weapon. getting anything in your lungs. You might get some chemical they release. Uh, but, but Ed, I think you've eaten a lot of bugs in your life, haven't I've you? I've suffered a lot from a lot of sprays from a lot of... I've probably been stung by more different kinds of ants around the world than any living person. But I'm not going to brag that on that. Anyway, this just gives you an idea, one of the kinds of pieces of equipment we carry with us. And what I wanted to tell you first is that as we talk, you're going to be seeing scenes uh, from the Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. It's a country uh, that is located in southeast Africa, just north of uh, South Africa. And uh, this is a country with a tragic history. It was under Portuguese control. It had an independence revolution, a very bloody one. And when it won its independence, then it had a terrible civil war, which lasted from 1978 to 1992, in the course of which one million people were killed. And three million actually were, had to, be, had to leave the country for a while. I mean, we're, our attention is today on the Middle East where you're having this kind of revolution going on. Uh, and we get news of it every day. But you know, in those days, we didn't hear much about the tragedy of Mozambique. At any rate, it was settled. Mozambique has a democracy now. It's a very poor country. But <clears throat> when everybody got settled back again, they discovered that their best park, the premier park, one of the best in Africa, the Gorongosa Park, had been very badly damaged. The uh, soldiers fighting in the war had headquarters, one side did, and uh, battles were fought in the park, and the soldiers, and then later poachers came in and shot off most of the large animals. So in uh, the early, uh, in the uh, around 2000, uh, it was in very poor shape when an American philanthropist named Greg Carr came and visited and for the Mozambican government agreed to examine the park and advise them on what could be done with it. And when he saw that here was a park which just like a person in an emergency ward could be saved, that park could, in his eyes, be restored. It had the basic ecosystem structures. It just lacked big animals. I mean, they'd been almost shot off. And he recommended to the Mozambican government that they restore that great park, and he did more than that. He actually volunteered to do it for them because he had the money, and he wanted to find one great thing to do with his life. He saw that it would be of enormous value to Mozambique, because then, of course, you know, they could build up ecotourism again, they could have something of great national pride, but also uh, because it was such an important thing to save the world's biodiversity. And now, in this part of my career, I'm spending more time with national parks. I'm involved with the Gorongosa. I've been back twice now advising on what to do. And here's what will interest you. I'm helping set up a study of the biodiversity, that's short for biological diversity, in which we are setting out not only to restore the big animals, they're coming back, the elephants and all of them, you know, being reintroduced and they're, the populations are building up, the park is looking pretty good, it's getting tourists again and so on. But in addition now, we're going to study the total biodiversity, all the plants, all the animals, down to the little insects, and maybe eventually even some of the bacteria to understand what makes a great park, how many species are involved, what they're doing, how the whole ecosystem works. And I would want to emphasize to you that the way the ecosystems work 
the swamps there, the grassland, that beautiful African savanna, uh, that, uh, that matters because that's a stable part of the Earth's surface once it gets going and comes back into equilibrium. And I want to remind you that that's where we originated. That's our place of origin, Africa, <clears throat> and that kind of habitat that's there, which I presume you're going to be you're seeing around me, uh, is where humanity originated. So when you talk about uh, what is um, the fauna and flora of Gorongosa Park, you have to say, well, among the species that are found naturally there is Homo sapiens. So it's very important to understand this park and other parks like it and to, and, to, uh, and, and to find out everything about it. How many species of plants and animals do you think we're going to find in the end? And the stories are just starting up now. And along with them, all of these studies that go on about the relationships between them and their biology and where they came from and what they do in, in their part of the uh, ecosystems and their niche. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an idea of what you can expect to find in a national park. It's being done right now in the Great Smokies uh, Mountain National Park in uh, North Carolina and Tennessee. And the <clears throat> estimate there is when they come to the end, they found just about all of the species that are there. Butterflies, ground beetles, praying mantises, argeopids, spiders, everything. <clears throat> they will have, and all the plants, they will have between found between 40,000 and 60,000 species, kind of creatures living there. A park like Gorongosa may well go to 100,000. A park in Upper Amazon, like the Asuni parks, could go to half a million. So our studies are just beginning of what's in these parks, what is on this planet. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit before I cut, cut you loose and let you answer asked me some questions about all this. Um, <clears throat> uh, our uh, national parks in this country are a treasure we should protect as much as we, are, as we can. I'm working with a national park system now to put more education and scientific research into it, as is being done in Gorongosa. This is going, I think, to become a national priority. I know that uh, the president wants to speak to the whole issue of improving science education and awareness of science uh, in America. We're pretty poor on that right now. And we're beginning to understand that one of the great ways to develop that kind of knowledge and that kind of education is with the study, particularly in younger people, of these natural systems. I mind you, biology is the science of the 21st century. Even if you may want to go into physics or engineering or whatever, bear in mind that it's on life, on the living organisms, that most of our uh, focus in science is going to, uh, is biology is where it's going to be uh, focused. And uh, so a good starting point and a baseline that we must somehow bring uh, into bear in our research, in our appreciation of our national heritage of our national parks. At this present time, for example, I'm helping plan one, a uh, creation of a new one we hope will be in my hometown of Mobile, Alabama. So I go down a great deal. Uh, I understand you couldn't tell I might be there from my accent, but uh, I uh, <laughs> am going home a lot these days and we're started trying to start a park down there. Now, why care? Why care about all these bugs uh, and all these other little creatures that we've just begun to study? Because uh, we depend on them for our very lives. We have something called ecological services. And it's been estimated that what these natural systems do for us in maintenance of the whole atmosphere, of the uh, trapping of our water systems, of the purification of our water, of the, uh, of the uh, regeneration of our soil, of the very air we breathe. All of this is crucial to human welfare in the future. It's been estimated 
If you could put a dollar sign on what all these wild creatures you're looking at now uh, around the world in every place, and particularly in these wild areas, you could put a dollar amount on them, uh, it would, of what they do for us, it would be approximately uh, equal, which has been estimated, to all of the gross domestic products of the world combined. That would be around $60 trillion now, I believe, a year. That's what we get from it, uh, Scott Free. And when we start studying these creatures for the first time in real depth, we're going to learn so much more about the nature of life, about the nature of our own bodies, for example. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of estimates of how ignorant we are and how much is left for you to do if you want to go into science yourself, maybe by this route of looking at uh, living systems of the kind you can find everywhere. Uh, at the present time, uh, we know about 6,000 kinds of frogs and salamanders in which North Carolina is very rich. Uh, for example, in the mountains you have large numbers of species of salamanders. The amphibians are like frogs. 6,000 are known. And one-third of those species, about 2,000, have been discovered only in the last 40 years. Uh, even though these are beautiful, well-known creatures, you'd think we're still finding new species. But this is dwarfed by the fungi, you know, mushrooms and rust and lichens and so on. And uh, what do I mean by being dwarfed? Well, uh, we estimate that right now the specialists who work on these important organisms, which are fundamental to the ecosystems, that uh, there are about 100,000 species known to science, but the real number is 1.5 million or more. In other words, we haven't even begun, scarcely around the world, to find out all the variety of fungi. And if you take something called roundworms, uh, these are not very romantic or important looking, little <laughs> tiny worms, called nematodes, keep in mind that four out of every five animals of all kind in the world are nematodes, four out of five. <laughs> you can't see them, but they're everywhere in the soil. Go check the soil and you'll see them just barely. Maybe in some of the soil that you bring here, you can start showing nematodes. We don't know why they're so important, why they're so abundant. Uh, if you'd like to have a tremendous scientific career, become a nematologist. Well, you know, in other words, specialize on nematodes. But I could say that about group after group after group of insects and plants, fungi and so on. There's a whole world of exploration waiting open for you if you're thinking about science. And you can do any kind of science, you know, like finding out the diversity, like finding out their physiology, like looking into their nervous system. That's the future of biology in the 21st century. Back to the nematodes, 20,000 species may be known, possibly millions actually exist. This is an unknown world, and I could go on and on with that. Uh, uh, but I want to draw this to a close by saying that we live on a little known planet. We are destroying the living environment at an accelerating rate. If we keep destroying natural environments like this beautiful park that we've illustrated for you here, the Gorongosa. If we keep on destroying it by cutting the timber, all of the lumber down, by developing in the wrong places, by allowing the continual influx of alien species that can extinguish new species, uh, the, the native species and so on, we're doing it carelessly at the present rate, we could lose half of the species, half of plants and animals, drive them into extinction by the end of the century. So, I will conclude, Meg, and then we'll chat back and forth. Um, and everybody, and you're invited, I don't know how much time we have, but I'll conclude right now by saying uh, that this is such an important center I'm thrilled by what's been put together here. I hope to see lots of them around the country because it shows you what you can do with your own hands and eyes right away, even if you've not yet gone and learned much about science. Um, it's very important to everyone sitting in this room, even if you are not going to end up 
I know you won't, probably a majority won't, going on through college uh, in a strict a scientific or technological career, uh, you're going to be deeply influenced by it. You've got to know it because uh, we are now in a whole new era of history, a techno-scientific, technology and scientific era. We're in the digital age and it's going to continue to be like that. There's no going back. Science and technology are going to pervade every aspect of our lives and our thinking. So we need to get a better education uh, than the present we, one we're getting, which is, has American students number 24 in the nations uh, in scientific knowledge. You're gonna have to, re we've gotta get up to the top and it's going to be extremely important. And once again, I will repeat, because I'm so concerned about the diversity of life, about bugs, about spiders. Show them your spider there. Oh, that's right. You should have got the spider, big spider a there in your pooter. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, uh, the little creepy, creepy crawlies and the little worms and all that stuff. I don't care what you think about them now, but I want to make an important part that they're vital to you. They're vital to your future. Uh, even if you stay apart from them in the kind of work you do, and even if it's scientific, they're vital to you. And I want you to be a, a major player yourself in your life uh, in preserving them. And one way of doing it is through education in museums like this, and also in preserving, helping preserve and visit and coming to understand and going and then bringing your children in time to wonderful places like the Gorin Gaza Park. So thank you for letting me talk to you. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, Ed. We might all have to go outside and catch insects after this. <laughs> that might. would be a wonderful opportunity. Hey, um, Meg, just one thing, just to talk about, you know, that is re actually is a fake spider, but it, it looks like a wolf. <laughs> he figured it out. A wolf spider. Now, if you'd like to see wolf spiders, they're really interesting. There's a great variety of them. Meg knows how to do that. You go out in the woods, make it a warm night, and uh, have a very strong light. You know, a lead light will do it. Yes. And then just start playing it across the ground, you know, in the woods, and you'll see diamonds. It's like sparkling diamonds scattered all through the woods. Every one of those diamonds is a pair of eyes of a wolf spider. So um, go by, go, just go around the way you'd go bird watching with your lead line and check out all the different kind of wolf spiders. I'm not sure that that'll turn you into an arachnologist, but it'd be an interesting thing to do, even if you're just out in the woods, carry on a lead light and check out the woods for wolf spiders. Sounds okay. like a we great could go plan. on like this forever, couldn't we? And Meg? a lot of wolf spiders in the canopy, so I need to get a headlamp. I think. That's right. She's the canopy lady, <laughs> our, our leading expert on what lives up in the canopy. Sure, we could have can do some that fun. Too. It's all amazing. You can just imagine. We wished we could sit here all day. Well, we have some students who have submitted questions. As Ed mentioned, in this virtual world of technology, we've allowed ourselves to have students send questions through online participation, as well as some of you who are in the audience today, which is really special. And so Brian, our science comedian, will be in charge of moving the microphone around, but we can call for question number one, and you'll give us your question and the school and student that submitted it. Thank you so much. Okay. From Rhiannon at Carolina Friends School in Durham and Stephanie from Pine View School in Osprey, Florida. Why did you study biodiversity and how has that benefited you? Uh, me personally, you know, I just got through explaining why I think it's so terribly important. But I, th I didn't have the good fortune of being when I was in school of a teacher or anyone like that. I was in small schools in Alabama towns uh, saying, you know, you got to study biology, Ed, you know, because it's important. That's what I'm doing with you. Um, what I did was, uh, what a lot of kids do, I had a bug period. That is, I was fascinated when I was five, six, seven, eight, uh, every time, everybody has a bug period. 
even if you think they're icky, you know, you have, they're, they're interesting. The difference was I never grew out of mine. And I had a lot of time, particularly when I was a Boy Scout. I became a Boy Scout. Boy Scouts gave me a lot of my education. Uh, <clears throat> spending a lot of time in the woods, and pretty soon I got an interest in collecting butterflies. I thought that was a, a really cool thing. We didn't call it cool in those days, but it was a cool thing to do. And I got more and more fascinated with everything I went, I saw and went. And then I learned that actually you can make a living doing this kind of thing. You know, you can be a park ranger. And the thing I had my sight on was, I, I just wanted to stay outdoors, that's all. It was a passion. I know each one of you has a passion, you know, a real interest developing. You'll develop new ones. And I hope some of you really are, have as part of that, this interest, as Megan and I do it when we were young, of, of really getting in the outdoors, of exploring, of, of uh, really enjoying it and finding new things. So I just kept that up and I, I thought I was going to end up as an entomologist. Maybe, you know, someone who studies insects, maybe I could get a job in the Department of Agriculture and that would do it. That would keep me outdoors. And then when I got to college, I discovered there are scientists who work on all these things. Maybe I could become a scientist. Well, that's the story of my life. You never look back. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful and good advice for everybody. Get outdoors and have some fun with the bugs. A bug is not a bug, though. Ed, maybe you should clarify that word bug. A spider? Or a true bug or a oh, bug Oh, a true bug. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the true bug. Uh, true bugs, to call a bug and be scientifically correct, you've got to have something that's in the order hemiptera. You know, and your favorite hemipteran these bugs, they have stink bugs and assassin bugs and so on. Uh, your favorite one is the bed bug. That's a real <laughs> bug. But the other, the other things, call them insects, okay? Right, right. insects right. it insects. is. Okay, question number two. I think this could be a global question submission. Yeah, um, Rakti from Addis, Ethiopia wants to know, what is your most dangerous or scariest field adventure while studying ants in remote parts of the world? Never been to Ethiopia, but uh, now I've said I'm working in Mozambique. That's a great place. Ethiopia would be too. Well, I guess uh, I'd answer that by saying I have two experiences. When I was a young guy, about 40, uh, 22 or 23, I was at Harvard, and I got the opportunity, I got a fellowship uh, and they said, well, you know, we want you to develop your research career and your studies and so on, and you can go anywhere in the world. This was a very nice fellowship. You know, they gave me the money to go anywhere. Well, uh, I wanted to go to New Guinea. Nobody had really been in New Guinea and work on ants there. I knew I'd find lots of species, and I'd also get to go to the New Hebrides, which is now called Vanuatu. So off I went. In 1954 and 55, I was there for 10 months, exploring at a time when there were no Americans anymore in that part of the world, and there were very few people, and I had to stay with planters, you know, in the interior, and I was really like a 19th century explorer. You can still do that, find places in the world where you are a genuine physical explorer that people haven't been before. But I had that experience, and then I was studying all these creatures, including especially ants, I was discovering new species. And I came back. And all through the years thereafter, I said, someday I'm going to go back, especially to New Caledonia, which is a marvelous place with ancient trees and beautiful insects. I said, I want to go back there. And see what it's like and continue working there. Last November, 57 years later, I took a small team from Harvard and we went to New Caledonia and Vanuatu, which is nearby, didn't make it to New Guinea. And I finally returned and I went back to the exactly the same spots I had been 57 years before. 
and I was able to compare them exactly across 57 years and my own experiences and collect more of the things I'd seen. And that's the great experience I had. And if there's any significance in that, um, it's that the study of natural history, uh, the study of these ecosystems and these wonderful creatures is a lifetime passion. It can be a lifetime passion. Any snake bites along the way? Oh, sure. <laughs> I got bitten by a lot of snakes. The only poisonous one, though, I got bitten was in Alabama. That was a, oh, my gosh. Yeah, a pygmy rattlesnake. I was having a pygmy rattlesnake. You know. Fortunately, it's a pygmy rattlesnake. They only get about this big. You probably have them here. And it snagged me on my finger. So um, I've read somewhere anybody that's stupid enough to handle rattlesnakes as a hobby or professionally as a you know, herpetologist is eventually going to get bitten by a poisonous <laughs> snake. So I had to go home. I was in a Boy Scout camp. And I uh, came home, and I had to lie at home with my parents looking at me disapprovingly with a big swollen arm. But I finally went down, and I went back to I didn't collect any more <coughs> poisonous snakes. Oh, your poor parents. <laughs> I can feel for them. <laughs> Question number three is dealing, I think, with some small things in the world. This is from Pamela's science class in Crest Middle School in Shelby, North Carolina. How would the world be impacted if there are no more protests? No more protests. And uh, you must be a biology student. Because, <laughs> you know, not everybody knows the protests of those little one-celled animals, like amoebae and paramecians. And, and incidentally, I don't want to send you scattering in all directions. No, I do want to send you in all directions. <laughs> you know, let's, uh, every person doing a certain thing taking their own special interest if they're going into biology. Uh, what would happen if you removed all of these? And I was going to say, incidentally, you know, we don't know more than a tiny fraction of what's really out there. Uh, what would happen if you took them all away? We'd all die. Because you just break, that's my guess. You would just break a huge link you know, in the world food chains and all, every aquatic environment, I think it would disturb uh, the living environment so quickly and so badly um, that um, maybe not every organism would die, but I know the human species would be in deep trouble. So an experiment we wouldn't like to conduct on planet Earth? No, I think it's a good question because um, we're not going to, if we would try, we couldn't get rid of all the protests. We don't want to do it. Uh, same is true of all the bacteria. Same is true of all these little roundworms. But unfortunately, we are doing it. Maybe not deliberately, but we're going rapidly down that path of getting rid of a, a large part of the plant world, you know, plant diversity and, and the big animal diversity. Uh, and we're just beginning to learn what happens when you take all those out. So uh, maybe we won't all die as a result of that, but that has serious consequences too. Thank you, Ed. Question number four. So the next question is from Anusha from Explorers Middle School. I think she should be up on the second balcony, actually. So right. if you want to give a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> she would like to know, at what age did you realize you wanted to study science? Actually, I already answered that in part. I think it was when I was about nine or ten years old, I decided that um, I'd like to do that if I could. Of course, you know, when you're that young, you don't think exactly in terms of careers in science. You just think about what it is that you'd like to do later in your life that, uh, and keep on doing. And uh, in my case, that was definitely being outdoors and exploring uh, natural history and so on. At this point, I should say, I've been putting heavy emphasis on biodiversity, you know, and careers in biology and interest in biology. I'm well aware, though, uh, that uh, lots of, uh, there are a lot of different passions that can lead 
to great careers in science and technology. And one of my favorite, because they, different people, and I'm no sure, some of you surely have had this experience or have this type of passion. Be very different. I want you to appreciate the living world, but you may have a very different passion that's already leading you uh, into uh, parts of maybe chemistry, technology, uh, mathematics, physics. Now, I know one of you I spoke to just this morning uh, was telling me about an interest in chemical engineering and I couldn't, you know, approve and suggest that, that uh, urge him more, uh, any more than I did, uh, uh, very much to go in that direction because there's such a great need for it. So follow your passion. I'm, one of my friends uh, is um, a great uh, molecular biologist. In fact, he was famous for having been the first to show the complementarity in the DNA molecule. And he told me one day how he got started, you know, just like being asked, how did you get started with bugs? He, he said, my parents gave me an erector set. Now this is one, an our age group, uh, you put together, they were metal bands and struts and you could build uh, structures with them in all sorts of directions. I'm sure there are toys like this now. Gave him an erector set. And he started building things and seeing how things fitted together and he just never got over it. So he went on and became a physicist and got into biology and the next thing he knew, he was dealing with models of the DNA molecule, you know, and taking it apart. <laughs> and he made one of the great discoveries in biology, in early molecular biology. So you never know. Follow your passion. Great advice. Raise your hand if you've ever thought of being a scientist when you grow up. Gosh. Oh my gosh. Tell them yeah. a little about this book coming out because they might oh. need to get that. Hey, listen, I've just emphasized the point. Of course, I'd, I'd love to know uh, all of you plan to go into science, but I know a lot of you will be going into other equally productive fields. And I guess what I would say to be more complete in my advice, uh, if, you're going, if you want to go into science, if you're feeling that passion, you really want to do this, go. The future is yours. But if you're going in another field, and the future will be there too, if you have the passion, if you work hard enough, uh, then still get that education in science and technology because you're living in a techno-scientific world now. Everything is going to be connected by that. Uh, I have a book coming out. I'm not trying to sell a book, uh, but uh, it's called Letters to a Young Scientist, and it'll be out in April. And I've taken everything I could possibly think of about making a scientific career, you know, of all kinds, uh, and once you decide you'd like to be a scientist or in technology or a closely related science-based based profession, I've tried to put in there. And it's advice on where to go, what to think about, how to get prepared, uh, how to choose a school, you know, to get more advanced studies, uh, how to actually begin to do research. Uh, at an early age, what research consists of, what science really is, how to be successful in science, even a little bit how to handle the politics of science once you get into it. So I hope that book will be useful to you. Great idea for purchase next March, maybe? Could be. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Question six. Oh, question five. Sorry, oh, yeah. I have to go back to math class. <laughs> So this is from uh, Nina, a uh, fifth grader at the Pine View School for the Gifted. Uh, I'm interested in your restoration of Gorongosa National Park. I was wondering how you knew that the park was destroyed in the Civil War. I was also wondering if Gorongosa National Park was once again rated the number one park in Africa. If not, do you plan on it being number one again soon? Very good question, and that's a very American question, <laughs> which is, are you number one? And why aren't you number one? <laughs> oh, so right now, incidentally, I'm a fan of, uh, of my alma mater, the Crimson Tide. And uh, so I insist on their remaining bigger than number one. And then I'm a fan of the Boston 
Patriots, New England Patriots. I think they're going to make the Super Bowl. Being number one, nothing less will be accepted. So that's a good American question. Yes. Uh, well, no, not yet. Because all of the, well, maybe it is, because all the parks in, in Mozambique were damaged. But it's on its way to being the best in Mozambique. And I believe that particularly since uh, uh, that Mr. Carr, uh, Greg Carr, who is financing this, insists that uh, he's going to build and attract the people to uh, the Center for Education and Research there in that park. They insist that it's going to be the best in Africa. Uh, I think we will make it the best in Africa. And that, that'll be a model. It might be even a model for parks in America because we haven't yet made much progress or even thought an awful lot about making our national parks centers for research and education. Nice, thank you. Question number six, the real six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a question from me. Um, what is the best way to bring a species back from the brink of extinction? What school are you from? I'm from Carolina Friends. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, right. Uh, okay, now we go to the emergency uh, wa ward of the uh, Biodiversity Hospital. And we do have uh, a list of a lot of species that are known to be on the edge of extinction. Not all of them. Pro probably we only know because of that imperfect knowledge I was telling you about. We don't know how many species are out there, much less have a complete list and understanding of each one. But we do have a, what's called a red list. It's put out by the International Union for the uh, uh, Protection of Nature. Uh, and um, the red list has uh, a lot of examples of species that are right on the brink. We call them critically endangered and there are lots of plans for bringing them back. Let me just give you an example of them. One that I used once called the 100 Heartbeat Club. That is, there are only 100 individuals left. 100 heartbeats still that means the end of the species, or close to 100. So uh, examples include, for example, the Sumatran rhino rhinoceros of Asia. Uh, this is the descendant of one of the oldest mammal groups known, direct descendant to go back as far as 30 million years. And the last couple of hundred individuals are hanging on in a few spots in Malaysia and Sumatra. And uh, there's a desperate attempt going on now with a couple of zoos to try to get them to breed. They're very difficult to breed in zoo conditions and also in pinned areas, but they can't, it's a fight to the end because uh, the, unfortunately, no matter how much you do, how much you try to protect them in natural reserves, poachers are after them. Why? Because rhinoceros horn is so valued in China uh, for its supposed medicinal value. It has no medicinal value. But the old, uh, uh, old Chinese-style medicine holds that it is. They believe it. The horn is worth more than its weight in gold, and poachers will risk their lives to kill one more. So it's a fight right now to hold on to it. Let me mention one more example. Uh, and I could really frighten you, or at least make us all depressed by going on through example after example of all the fights that are going on around the struggle, you know, to keep certain species alive. And then I'm going to tell you a success story, okay? The next one is that there are a number of Hawaiian plants. Hawaii is uh, the extinction capital of America. It has the largest number of species that have been driven into extinction, including they had used it started with 125 beautiful bird species, and it's down to 25 now. They've distinguished all of them, except for 25 that are very rare. In the case of plants, there are plants in Hawaii in which we have only one plant left. 
And horticulturalists are desperately trying to clone it from leaf parts and so on to hold on to that species. Um, now let me give you a success story. There's, in New Zealand, there was a, is a species called the New Zealand black robin. And that one, like so many species in New Zealand, were declining, declining, going extinct, going extinct, declining, declining. Till finally, uh, in the case of the black robin, there were two individuals left, and it was pretty much written off. But that unique species was on the North South Island was going to disappear at any time. But then an intrepid group of people decided, by God, they're going to give one last chance. Give it one last chance. They netted both species. You can net birds without harming them with special webs, you know, you fly into. And they had these two adult birds, the last of their species. And one was a male and one was a female. So they set them up into a nice aviary and started giving food and prayed. And it turned out, yes, they liked each other, and yes, they were terrifically fertile. And before long, they had a little growing population of New Zealand bl uh, black robins. And finally, they reached the point, of course, they were pretty inbred, but they reached the point where they had enough so they could start releasing black robins back into the wild. And that species, I haven't heard the latest report, they saved that species. There are a few stories like that. And um, there are real stories of heroism of people who've managed to save a species or had the ingenuity and the courage and drive to do it. And we need more of those people. It can be done, but it's very, very difficult. Question number seven. This one comes from Tyler Kill of Carolina Friends School. Explain some of the effects climate change is having on biodiversity? Uh, <clears throat> actually, I can summarize it, the effects that climate change is having on biodiversity in three words. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you what we're thinking about doing to mitigate its effects, and including the United States. Of course, you've been hearing about the melting of the sea ice of the Arctic, that's bad. And, and it's, uh, it's really diminishing the uh, a number of species, most famously the polar bear, which depends on sea ice. But in other parts of the world, we're already seeing the bad effects of it. Uh, probably the most notable is um, the um, driving upward of the forest, of the rainforest of the, uh, of the tropics around the world, such as Central America. In the tropical forests of the world, you have very tight zoning. You know, just going a few hundred meters on up takes you from one kind of rainforest, type of rainforest and a species in it, to another one. Now imagine you go right to near the top in the central cordillera of Central America, you know, the mountain ranges, and all those plants and the animals that are special there. Now imagine that the climate change, I'm not imagining it's happening, climate change is measurably moving the zones up. What happens to the one at the top? Gone. And that is beginning to happen. And one of the species that probably have played a role in extinguishing. I just saw a picture of here. It's the golden toad of Costa Rica. It used to be almost a symbol of natural history in the country of Costa Rica. Beautiful uh, little animal. <coughs> and uh, they were there in thousands one year. And then within a couple of years, gone. It's extinct. Uh, so how do we get around that? Well, let's take the United States. I'm involved in a project right now. And um, the project by which we can do this, this is sort of looking into the future, but I want to see it getting started quickly, is to not just have national parks but to, and reserves of all kinds, but to connect them so we have corridors that run along. So that when the climate changes, as it will, say, from north to south, and then east to west, you know, from west to east in the southern United States, we're seeing a gradual encroachment of drier conditions. And the species that require um, 
moist conditions in, along the coast of the, of the United States need to be able to, there's plants and animals, they need to be able to move, not to get up and walk, but you know, that they send out offspring and seeds and so on so they can spread in front of the climate changed conditions. So there's now a beginning movement in the conservation prof profession of uh, planning and thinking seriously about corridors that run across entire continents or between continents. And I'm involved right now in the planning of it, the early planning of one that will go across the southern United States. And it's practical. We show that it, we can show that it can be done. It'll take some land purchase, but there are a lot of ways of linking these various reserves and in one case army bases uh, by uh, putting corridors between them. And then we can have a continuous uh, natural reserve that goes from one end to the other. In this case, what we have is planned is from Tallahassee across down the Florida, or along the Florida panhandle, all the way to Louisiana. We're going to do it. And the Nash new National Park of Mobile is going to be part of it. At the same time, one has already been done. It hasn't been heralded much, but the state of Florida has actually got a corridor that runs now continuously from the Everglades to the Georgia border and the Okefenokee. There's another one that can be done pretty quickly uh, if we put our minds to it, it becomes a national goal. It goes from the Yukon to Yellowstone, continuous, you know, so that those northern creatures can move south and from the Yukon down the Rocky Mountains and maybe to the Sky Island uh, mountains of Arizona jump over to the Sierra Madre Occidental of Mexico and on down to the mountains of Central America. This is the kind of big thinking we need to be doing. You often hear about Americans. We're sort of getting lazy, we're getting flaccid. We're not, in, we haven't got any big ideas now, you know, like landing on the moon and so on. Uh, we're sort of quarreling among ourselves about this and about that. We need big ideas. Well, here's a big idea. Let's build corridors and save America's flora and fauna. Great big idea. That's wonderful. Um, I think we have a tweeter, Twitter question coming in from our virtual audience. So, Brian, can you share that? Exactly. So, a lot of people are viewing in various places and following on the hashtag EO Wilson. And we have a question from Cowish in Auburn, Alabama, oh. who asks, how is the human race evolving right now. How is it involving? Okay. Auburn is dear to my heart, <laughs> even though I'm from the University of Alabama. And it so happens that I will be with him uh, at Auburn in a few months. I'm, I've had the honor of uh, giving the opening address at the opening of the, um, the new Natural History Museum at Auburn. So Alabama is trying to keep up with North Carolina, you see. <laughs> Uh, and is the human species evolving at all? Well, yes it is, but not in the way you might expect when you first think about it. We haven't, we're not going to manage to get any bigger brains. I mean, actually we have enough if we use uh, what we have correctly. We're not going to be getting canines in spite of all the popularity of the vampire films. <laughs> we're not going to get this, we're going to get it bigger, we're not going to get it smaller. Generally what we're doing is homogenizing. And I think when you consider that for just a moment, you see the consequences of that. Uh, what we're doing is spreading ourselves all around, the all around the globe. People from everywhere are going to new places, new countries. We're blending everywhere. Uh, it'll take generations for it to really show as fully as what the potential is. But the differences that we had 100, 200 years ago, from one place to another, shall we say from Switzerland, from Geneva to Beijing, uh, big differences in the way people looked and characteristics of their bodies and skin color and everything else. Um, <clears throat> that's going to, the difference between places is diminishing. But what's happening is each place, each city, each country, 
the variation among people through intermarriage uh, is increasing vastly. So worldwide, what we're getting is a huge increase in the variety, genetic variety of people. And I like that. I think America should be itself a country priding itself in making as a primary, a primary uh, trait and goal uh, our diversity. This should become a great, the great American virtue. We cannot imagine what new combinations of, of traits people will have, of what new abilities that could emerge from this. Uh, in the arts and science and in every human activity. Human species has not been tested on what it can put together by combining different people's genomes or kinetics. We're going to test it. I think we're going to come out way ahead as a result of it. Thank you for that. We are coming a little closer to the end of time, so I'm going to actually read a question from a teacher because we had a lot of <coughs> wonderful teachers out there who are, we hope and know, uh, part of the glue that will keep this future system together. Um, and this is a great question to wrap up our session. Uh, they ask you, please, this is uh, a biology teacher from Southview High School in Hope Mills, North Carolina, and she would love to know what is one recommendation for my students of an action they can tell, take to help to preserve biodiversity. Um, well, I, I, I have to give you two. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> First of all, please do what I, and I know that teacher also would recommend, uh, and science teachers everywhere, is please uh, encourage your students ever more in any way you can, you know, to learn science, learn it well, and develop a lasting interest in it. And that then will lead to the kind of understanding that you need to have, we need to have to save, among many other things that, you, that we need to have that kind of education in the population as a whole, uh, but we need it in order to be able to save the rest of our biological diversity in this country and elsewhere. Uh, so that's, that's a very important thing. Now, how do you do that? I think most good teachers, I'm sure the ones sitting here with us today are the good teachers among the good teachers, uh, would agree with a, a saying I love. Uh, I can't locate the origin of it, and it may well come from a Chinese cookie wrapper, but it doesn't matter, and that's a saying I just love. If you teach me, I will forget. If you show me, I will remember. If you involve me, I will understand. So the thing to do is to uh, get your students involved in this domain of science and civic activity in natural environments immediately around, you know, studying them, visiting them, using them as natural laboratories. Nice, fantastic. And we do have here at the museum a fabulous citizen science area that I think everyone might see in a minute, which is a great segue to what will be phase two of our afternoon with Professor Wilson. Uh, for now, I know there are other questions out there, but we are going to make a wrap of this wonderful conversation, conservation conversation. Okay. How's that? And um, I would like everyone to join me in thanking Professor Wilson for this amazing opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.